when I was a kid, my dad worked on many political campaigns. He believed strongly in the candidates, but he also believed firmly that his own actions, canvassing door to door or working election day, would really make a difference. And he was right. In the next half hour, I want to introduce you to people all around Chicago who are working hard to make a difference in their own communities. There's the childhood friends who reunited to bring biking to the south and west sides. The mom who made a mural happen after gang violence struck her neighborhood. The ex-offender who is bringing yoga to the community he damaged many years earlier. And a hot Chicago artist who practices the art of community development. Stay with us. That's right now on Jay's Chicago. Hi, I'm Jay Shefsky. Chicago has many nicknames. The city of big shoulders, the city of neighborhoods. We could also be called the city of murals. There are more than 140 outdoor community murals in Chicago. And this first story is about a group of neighbors getting together to create a new one. If you get off the inbound Kennedy Expressway at Addison these days, expect to be greeted by something pretty spectacular. A bold, colorful mural painted by more than 200 people from several Northwest Side neighborhoods. The painting took just a few days, but the project got its start about a year earlier. Joni Friedman was walking past the ugly, pigeon-dropping, splattered wall for the tenth time that week when inspiration struck. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if we had a mural? <laughs> it just kind of popped in my head. I thought, that would be amazing, it would be colorful, it would make it more inviting, I'd look forward to going through it. She began to talk about the idea with friends. But her dream really got going when an act of violence shook the community. In a quiet park not far from the mural site, two young girls were struck by stray bullets. The shooter was from a gang in another part of the city. Both girls survived. At community meetings, police encouraged residents to get to know their neighbors. Joni had lived in Avondale for six years. She didn't know that many of her neighbors, and she didn't want to start knocking on doors. But she has worked for community arts programs, both at the University of Chicago and at Red Moon Theater. So she says she knew how art can bring people together. But even Joni's infectious enthusiasm wasn't going to be enough to make a mural happen. Projects like this require either a lot of money or plenty of luck. I talked to my friend John Pounds, who works for the Chicago Public Art Group. And he came over and said, whoa, Joni, this is one of the best walls in all of Chicago. It's got great sight lines, it's beautiful, it's in good shape, and I got more excited. But then he told me it would probably cost about $150,000. A budget like that includes paying the artist a good fee, plus expenses for paid staff, materials, and more. Joni couldn't imagine raising that much money. Instead, she wound up having lots of good luck. The first bit of luck was meeting Anna Zelkowski sober an experienced, no-nonsense community activist from the old Irving Park neighborhood just to the north. She's already honchoed eight other murals. Our neighborhoods are where we spend, you know, half of our lives. And we can either go, eh, you know, just take what it gives us, or we can transform it into something better. Then came stroke of luck number two. Cesario Moreno lives nearby and wanted to get involved. He's the chief curator of the National Museum of Mexican Art in Chicago. All neighborhoods need murals. Uh, public art is so important, but it's not just about putting paint on a wall. It's not just about decorating uh, a part of your neighborhood. It's really about bringing together people. It was a community mural dream team. The enthusiastic project cheerleader the seasoned organizer, and the artistically sophisticated chief curator. Now all they needed was an artist. My name is Rafael Lopez. I've been very lucky in my career as an illustrator and as an artist. And it's sort of like good karma to just dedicate one month out of your whole year to do something and give it back for free. You know, just volunteer your work. Lucky strike number three, Rafael Lopez. For us to have a real Rafael 
Lopez mural here in the city is fantastic. As far as illustrators and designers go, Rafael is tops. His children's books, uh, his designs, his murals, he is at the top of his game. Why don't you guys go to Dan? With Rafael Lopez donating his time and design and everyone else on the project volunteering, the mural cost about $7,000. It's more than 100 feet long, and unlike many community murals, the design is neither political nor historical. It's more about calming the mind, you know, making you stop and reflect. And I have a lot of imagery that I think is very positive. His style, I would have to say it's very, very whimsical. Being a children's book illustrator, uh, I think he's very, very good. He's honed his skills at really telling a story using very simple icons that everybody can understand. But the design, the line quality, the colors he uses, those are spectacular. Those are uniquely Rafael Lopez. The mural is technically in the Avondale neighborhood, but it's really at the intersection of several communities. And that helped them draw in lots more volunteers. And it was really amazing as how the buzz spread and it was people reaching out to their neighbors, people reaching out to the playmates at the park, commuters seeing a sign on the wall. So it really turned into a cross-country, cross-cultural, cross-community effort. But can a mural really make a community safer? The police encourage residents to get to know their neighbors and that has certainly happened. What a project like this does is bring different parts of the community together help them find what they have in common. And once you have people engaged and out on the streets and gardening and painting and creating places of beauty, that's a deterrent to evildoers, to gangbangers. And the mural has also had an impact on the people who made it happen. This has been a wonderful education for me to get to know the larger Northwest um, side and also to just feel empowered that I could do something. You could. Anyone can make something happen if you just say, what could be here, and kind of dream it up. Most of us think about bicycling for fun, exercise, or transportation. This next story is about cyclists with much bigger goals. It's about a bicycling movement that aims to make biking as popular on the south and west sides of Chicago as it is on the north side. <laughs> it's a chilly and rainy fall day in Chicago. Yet dozens of people have come from all over the Chicago area for a bike ride through the south side neighborhoods of Roseland and Pullman. Several riders record the trip. One even has a handlebar cam. The increasingly wet ride was organized by a group called Slow Roll Chicago. It was an amazing ride. We had adults, young people, uh, all you know, racial and ethnic backgrounds from all different parts of the city. Slow Roll Chicago is the creation of Obai Reed and Jamal Julian. I caught up with them on a warmer, drier day later in the week. How was the weather? Oh man. <laughs> Obai and Jamal have known each other since fourth grade. They rode bikes together as kids, but say that somewhere along the way, biking stopped being cool. There's a perception in our community that biking is something that white people do on the north side, that crazy people do in the winter, or that poor people do when they don't have a car. We're responsible for that cultural shift that needs to take place in our community to turn biking into something that's cool and interesting and fun. Obai and Jamal have a big vision for Slow Roll Chicago. First, get more African-American Chicagoans riding bikes. Second, give outsiders a fresh look at the south and west sides. So there's this media perception that bullets are whizzing past your head on the <laughs> south side and west side. And here we are. You know, we're sitting on a tree line, you know, street on the south side in Bronzeville. And, you know, it's quiet and everything's calm. So when we're biking through the community, maybe we'll encourage somebody to come out of their doors. We'll encourage some other folks to come into those neighborhoods and support some of the local proprietors that have some awesome shops. 
But their third and perhaps most ambitious goal is to have a real impact on some of the problems that do exist. We're also not naive right. about the condition of our communities. We recognize that, you know, that crime is a challenge and that violence is a challenge. As avid cyclists though, our contribution to improving the condition of our community is Slow Road Chicago. We believe that increased biking in our communities can contribute to improving the condition of our communities and can have an impact on reducing violence. One of the things I wanted to ask Obai and Jamal about was safety. But it wasn't until the end of our ride that it hit me. I forgot to put on my own helmet. Safety is a, a priority for us. Uh -huh. You know, we ride with young people. We ride with people who are new to biking. And we encourage people to wear helmets when they ride with us. We don't require it, though. I personally, you know, don't wear a helmet a, a lot of the time, but I don't want people to, you know, follow my example. <laughs> I, I really encourage people to wear helmets. See, and I, and I see, and I always wear a helmet. My wife is going to see this. She is going to oh, kill me. Yeah. Slow Roll Chicago was inspired by Slow Roll Detroit. Our first time seeing Slow Roll, we were watching a video on Facebook, and we were just blown away with this video. It was so many people, and the, and the group was so diverse. How many people do they get on a ride? They average right now to this day about 4,000 people every Weekly. Monday <laughs> night. Slow Roll Detroit got the attention of Apple, which featured it in an iPad commercial. Nobody thought of Detroit as a bike-friendly city, and here they are, averaging 4,000 people every Monday night. So they blew us away. They blew us away when that, it, it that ride And it wasn't very over. long after that, you know, that we actually reached out to them and started talking to them and strategizing as to how we could bring the movement to Chicago. The first Chicago ride was in September 2014 and had 25 riders. This rainy ride was the second Slow Roll Chicago ride, and it drew 75 people. Slow Roll Chicago is slow to make it easy for everyone to participate and get to know each other. And they say they're greeted enthusiastically by people along the route. It's not often you see a diverse group of people, 50, 75 strong, riding down the street and people are blown away. <laughs> right, I mean, they're they like, wave, whoa, they, who is this? They're like, good morning, uh, happy day, good day, you know. But in addition to getting the attention of their neighbors, Obai and Jamal want to be noticed by the city. Our communities require protected bike lanes, safe paved streets that we can ride down and feel comfortable and feel safe. It requires more divvy stations. So, you know, we're hoping that we can create a partnership with the policymakers so that we can do our part in our community to turn biking into something that's cool and interesting that our people are interested in doing and that the city is, is open and can see the idea, the vision of a bikeable south side and west side just like we see a bikeable north side. All the people in this episode are finding ways to strengthen their communities, biking, murals, or in this case, yoga. So let's come centered into the mat. Marshawn Feltis has been teaching yoga at Bethel New Life in Austin since 2012. He says he never expected to practice yoga, let alone teach it. Let's get ready to dissolve the gunk of the week. I had been a uh, power lifter for years, so you know, my body was tight and, and buffed and you know, that was the look and exhale coming up. The little exposure that I had from yoga was seeing, you know, white women, you know, so I thought it was an exercise for like white women, you know. On the inhale, bring it back. Marshawn became a power lifter during the 19 years he spent in prison for murder. Good, releasing the pose. But although he looked great, he says, his body was a mess. People didn't know that I would go in my cell and in that nighttime, I would cry against the wall because I'd be in so much pain from, you know, damaged shoulder, my knee, and just overall the wear and tear on my muscles. And you're going stiff as a board, bring it across the chest. In the prison yard, there was this one inmate that everyone called Buddha. They thought he was doing some kind of martial arts. Turned out it was yoga. 
he invited me to come out and practice with him, but you know, I had a little bit of a reputation and I was like, nah, <laughs> you know. But when he heard that yoga had helped this guy's back pain, Marshawn gave it a try. And he says it changed his life. It reduced his pain and his stress, and he slept better. Marshawn learned as much as he could from Buddha and read all the books he could get his hands on. All right, give me just a little straighten here. He was released from prison in 2011. Now he's trying to pay back a community that he damaged 20 years ago when at age 17 he shot and killed another teenager. You know, I was a young kid running through the city of Chicago, you know, with a kind of belief that, you know, this was my block and, you know, this our hood. And so from that, I caused a lot of chaos. From the side, deep breath up top tall. There's no way that you could ever bring back a life. But to be able to see people flourish from uh, what you can give them, even though, you, you know, there's some things that I can't repair, uh, for those things that I can repair. That's what I want to do. That's, that's what I feel like I'm called to. And how's it been for you? It has been awesome. It is learning to do things and stretches and poses with my body that I really didn't know I could do. Felt a little challenged at first, but Marshawn is really great in just teaching us how to breathe into the poses. Marshawn's classes include people of all ages. He says he feels especially called to reach out to young men but that's tough. With young men, it's first like, what? Yoga, what's that? You know, <laughs> it's hard to penetrate them uh, because they put up this shield mm -hmm. of toughness. But when I'm going to them, you know, because of my experience, I believe I have a, I can find some kind of way in, you know, there's always gonna be a telltale sign of weakness. And, you know, in a criminal world, that's what you look for to kind of manipulate. Uh, but in what I do now, I look for that to, to, to use it as a door to get in. For him to come out of prison to do what he's doing is an inspiration because our young guys out on the street, they're on the street because they're, where's the hope? So he brings them hope. Marshawn also teaches at the Cook County Jail. He has gotten some young men into his regular classes, but that doesn't mean they'll show up when a TV camera is around. I said, well, you know, Channel 11 is going to, well, no, I'm, com I'm not coming Thursday. So, <laughs> yeah, it's that whole thing. Uh, oh, well. You know, I'm not doing anything wrong, but at the same time, I don't want, you know, I don't want the paparazzis in my business, you know. <laughs> Press the toe back and bring the hip bone up towards the ceiling. Marshawn Feltis says he has gotten offers to teach at health clubs in other parts of the city but he's committed to making yoga work on the west side. What I want yoga to do is to be able to bring balance to people's lives. Uh, physically, uh, you know, the big talk now in the country is affordable health care. Uh, but my thing is that yoga is the true affordable health care. It's the thing that you can do uh, with very little cost. And the effects are long term. You know, there's uh, people that are in their 80s and 90s that are breathing and stretching and they look good for doing it. And exhale. A lot of times urban communities, yoga is not something that we're into or we kind of think of it as something for other people, but it really is something for us. It's something for everybody because it's something just for our bodies. This next story is about a man who is arguably the hottest artist in Chicago right now. He's at exhibitions all around the world. His work sells for six figures. But it's not just his art that's getting him a lot of attention. He's also an unusual kind of real estate developer. His name is Theaster Gates. This space, we call it the, the chop shop. Theaster Gates likes to use reclaimed building materials in his art. And it starts here in the chop shop. The materials come in here, um, they get denailed, they uh -huh. get cleaned up, sanded, categorized. But you know, just kind of thinking about how these materials could have new life and, right. and aid me in a, in a creative practice. He likes reclaimed materials, he says, because they can have what he calls a charge, a meaning that's drawn from their history. This new work is one of a series of sculptural pieces that uses lengths of old fire hose and are meant to evoke civil rights struggles. I feel like I spent a lot of time trying to kind of unearth these histories because it's those loaded histories that start to give the thing real value. 
Fiester Gates is by no means your typical international art star. I grew up here in Chicago on the west side. You know, I have a big family. I'm, I'm the ninth child of, of nine, I'm the only boy. And, and so uh, I grew up in a, you know, in a space where I was both um, loved a lot and given a lot of care, but I was also really aware of, um, of the fact that my neighborhood like was maybe you know, a little bit rough. Gates' sculptures, art installations, and performance pieces have landed him major shows around the world, from the Whitney Biennial to Documenta 13 in Germany to London's White Cube Gallery. He's not just making art objects for us to look at and to appreciate, but there's all of the social uh, agitation and activism behind those things. Theaster Gates' art sells for six figures, and that has given him the freedom to follow another passion, bringing art and culture to low-income communities. These days, Gates is getting at least as much attention for his art-focused community development work as he is for his art. His most ambitious project so far is this long-abandoned bank on South Stony Island Avenue. I love this building. It's one of the last great, great buildings on Stony Island. Gates is negotiating with the city to turn it into a cultural arts center with galleries and performance space and food. This first floor in perimeter will be, uh, we hope, uh, a really uh, nice restaurant establishment that has also um, a culinary education component. A few blocks from the bank is an empty public housing project. Gates is working to turn that into an arts-focused mixed-income development. So far, most of Gates' brand of art-centered urban development is on the south side in the Grand Crossing neighborhood, a community with real problems and, he says, unfair stigma. It's had the burden of the stigma of the black south side. Um, it's, it's had a somewhat violent past. Um, bad things happen there even though it's a good place. As a result, there's this uh, belief that um, there is no possibility of, of future economic value in this neighborhood. Theaster Gates is also creating four community arts houses nearby. This one offers screenings of black cinema for people in the neighborhood. A house across the street has an art and architecture library and a meeting and dining space. Gates uses that house to regularly bring together a diverse group of Chicagoans for soul food dinners. Let's assume that people like to eat and, and people like being invited to things. When we're together, a kind of magic happens through performance, through these new relationships, through the food. When you talk to people about Theaster Gates, two things seem to always come up his undeniable charisma, and his remarkable ability to move between worlds. My day may take me from a really fancy place to a not so fancy place. I don't want to just be in the poor place or just be in the, the abundant place. I want to believe that abundance could happen in the poor place and that um, rich places have poverty, so and so. In high school, Gates left his neighborhood and went to Lane Tech on the north side. That, he says, was where the bridge building began. It was in between these two worlds that I started to kind of craft this new and more complex life. Instead of just choosing one world or the other, one world over the other, how can I live kind of in between them? Theaster Gates knows that when artists move into a neighborhood, they often begin a process of gentrification that can, in the end, push out the original residents. He wants his work to be a model for how it can be different. We can be intentional about um, the development that we do. And if we are intentional, that you'd hope for a mixed community, a diverse group of people economically, racially, culturally. I've been working on this job. Yeah. I've been wailing on this job. Fiesta Gates' whole life seems to have led him to this moment to an artistic practice that is about finding meaning and value in discarded things, and about building bridges, not only between people, but between art and everyday life. 
If you'd like to watch more Jay's Chicago stories or share them with your friends, go to our website at wttw.com slash Jay's Chicago. You can also find out more about many of our subjects. And while you're there, tell us what you thought of the show and send us your own story ideas. I'm Jay Shefsky. Thanks for watching. Thank you.